welcome back. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm not talking about a book, I'm talking about a movie. This should be pretty obvious from the title of this video, but if you don't want spoilers for the movie Black Bear, don't watch this. Black Bear came out earlier in 2020, this year. It stars Aubrey Plaza, Christopher Abbott, and Sarah Gadden. On Rotten Tomatoes, it currently has a 64% audience score and an 87% critic score, so it's one of those movies. I mean, that's not a huge disparity, but it's not super surprising to me because this is a very artsy film and it's very dialogue heavy. The plot of this movie can't really be summarized very easily in a single sentence or two. I think that was sort of the point. I watched an interview with the director and he said that this was his chance to make a movie that he didn't have to pitch to people and explain to people, so it's hard to explain. But I thought it was really excellent, and this movie reminded me pretty much immediately of two things. The first one is a play called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And the second one is a movie called Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive. In Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf we have this couple, and they invite another couple over for drinks. They drink way too much, they argue, they play mind games with each other, they make their guests very uncomfortable, and it takes place over the course of a single night. So if you've seen Black Bear, you can see the similarities there. Mulholland Drive is similar because it features two female characters who are, whose identities are kind of morphing and shifting and blending into one another. I mean, I really can't explain what happens in Mulholland Drive. It's a very weird movie. but. There are similarities there as well. Black Bear is not the most fun, entertaining movie. It's very heavy, but I think all the actors do an excellent job. I thought the cinematography was really beautiful. It's filmed in the Adirondacks, so it's just really pretty, and the house they're in is really pretty. The sound design was also really great. They're on a lake, and you can hear these really nice bug sounds and loon sounds in the background, and it's all just very, very atmospheric and beautiful. In terms of genre, people are calling this a thriller, a comedy, and a drama. I don't know about that. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand why this movie's funny. I didn't think it was funny at all. There's parts where Aubrey Plaza is very, like, charming, um, but I never once laughed at anything. And I wouldn't call it a thriller either. I think that's really misleading. The trailer is really excellent, and the trailer definitely makes it look like a thriller. To me, a thriller is fast-paced, plot-driven, it has twists and turns. There are twists and turns in this movie, but I just didn't think of it as a thriller. I think that's a little misleading. I would say that it's a drama with some thriller aspects in terms of its aesthetic. So I'm assuming that if you've clicked on this video, then you've probably already seen Black Bear and you want someone to help you understand it because it's very confusing. So I'm just going to start with a plot synopsis to refresh your memory. So this movie is about Allison. She's a actor and also a director and writer and she's going to this couple's house that is sort of a writer's retreat, but she gets there and there's nobody else there. It's just Gabe and Blair and there's immediately tension between these three people. Gabe and Allison are pretty openly flirting with each other. They all drink too much even though Blair is pregnant and Blair is clearly worried about the two of them flirting and then Allison and Gabe do end up having sex. Blair catches them, hits Gabe over the head, they have like a tussle, and then she's bleeding, and then, you know, she's pregnant, and it's just very, very tense, and they get in the car, and they're going to the hospital, and they see a bear, and Aubrey, <laughs> Aubrey, Allison, <laughs> crashes the car. Or at least that's what you think happens, <laughs> but then <laughs> the movie restarts. So there's this one very important shot that comes up four times in the movie, and we get four different title screens. This opens the movie with Allison by the lake, looking off into the lake. She's wearing a red bathing suit. She goes inside. She writes in her notebook, presumably, starting her screenplay. And then we get the title screen that says, Black Bear. But then she keeps writing, and we get the title screen, The Bear in the Road. After the car crash, we fade to black, and we get another title screen, our third title screen, that reads, Part 2, The Bear by the Boathouse. And then Allison starts walking away from the lake and presumably inside, but she doesn't go inside, and then it's revealed that she's on a movie set. So in this version of things, in part two, Allison retains many aspects of her character that are established in part one, but she is married to Gabe, and she's acting alongside Blair in a movie that Gabe is directing. Now Gabe is also emotionally manipulating Allison because he thinks it'll make the movie better because the, in the movie, Allison is concerned that Blair is 
sleeping with or about to sleep with the person who's obviously playing Gabe. They look like practically exactly the same. And so he thinks it'll be more realistic if she's actually worried about her actual husband sleeping with actual Blair. It's terrible. And in this version of things, it ends with Allison finding Gabe and Blair sleeping together and then she sees a bear and she just walks straight towards it. So then we get our final scene of Allison by the lake in the red bathing suit. She walks into the house to write presumably and she looks directly into the camera and we get another title screen that just says Black Bear. So what the hell happened in this movie? <laughs> It's very confusing, and it's made all the more confusing by the fact that it centers around Allison, and Allison is not a trustworthy source of information. In part one, she's constantly, constantly lying. I'll show you a clip that demonstrates that. I'm kidding. Are you kidding about your mom? No. You really are to read. Yeah, you know what, I get that all the time, but I actually think that I'm so easy to read that people just get confused and they make it harder on themselves. So first of all, I don't think we actually can get a definitive answer to what this movie is about, and that might actually be the wrong question to even be asking, but this movie does seem to create a sort of logical itch that you can't help to scratch. I compared it at the beginning of this video to Mulholland Drive. The thing is that Mulholland Drive is so weird and confusing that... I leave a movie like that and I don't even bother trying to figure it out because I don't think it's figure outable. But this movie is less weird and it exists at this perfect spot where you feel like you should be able to make it make sense. When I was thinking about this, I came up with this sort of like rough graph for weird movies or where you could place really any movie on a spectrum from real to unreal or surreal. On, on one axis and simple to complex on another axis. I'll just show you a picture of that. And so I think that most David Lynch movies like Mulholland Drive exist in like the bottom right corner of that graph. They're very complex, they're very surreal. And this movie is just less complex and less surreal. So you feel like you should be able to figure it out. But I do think that we're essentially just trying to shove puzzle pieces together that don't fit. Because each part of this movie is actually very simple and straightforward. It's just that the construction of the movie that's confusing and that makes sense based on what the director said about his process. So apparently he just started writing and he said it was very intuitive and when he got to the end of the story it just it wasn't the end of a movie. So then he just decided instead of making a linear logical next step he just started over with a new story that would comment on and be in conversation with the first story. He also said that he's interested in making movies that make you, people think about them as constructions, which is, I guess, what I'm doing by making this video. I ultimately think that these are just two separate stories uh, that comment on each other, that are in conversation, and that there is no logical way to fit them together. But if you must make them fit together, I think there are three main theories that I will explain. These are not the only theories, but they're the most compelling ones to me. Theory number one, the entire thing is just Allison's creation. So as I said, we have four different bathing suit by the lake writing scenes leading to four different title screens. We're constantly being reminded that Allison is writing and that that writing has some sort of connection to what we're seeing, but the connection isn't made explicit or clear. This is the neatest explanation, but I don't find it satisfying at all. I feel like it's like saying that you get to the end of a movie and it was all a dream, right? It makes sense, I guess, but what's the point? What does that framing do for me? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't add any meaning. So I don't really like that one, <laughs> but if you need a neat explanation, it works. Theories number two and three are related. Basically, you could decide that either part one or part two, the first half and the second half of the movie, one of them has to be real and one of them has to be not real. One of them can be a screenplay or an actual movie because both halves of the movie can't be real, right? We can't have Allison be both Gabe's wife and not Gabe's wife. That's just not how reality works. So theory number two states that the first section is real and the second one is Allison's screenplay. You know, some supporting evidence for this theory would be that you could envision Allison going to the lake house in part one to get inspiration for a story and that's exactly what happens. She gets inspiration for a story. And that makes sense to me because she's really messing with them. 
in part one and so I could kind of envision her almost poking at their relationship problems for inspiration for a draft. And that would work really well with one of the big themes of this movie which is doing harm to people in the service of your art. So theory number three, the second part is real and the first part is a screenplay. So to me when we get the revelation that there's a movie happening within the movie that part feels more real to me. I think it might just be because in a movie the things that are revealed later on feel like they should be getting closer to the truth as opposed to farther away from it. But also, I mean when you sit down to watch a movie, you know you're watching a movie, you're just pretending that it's real. But then I feel like if a film crew shows up within the movie, you feel like, okay, maybe this is like a documentary. Like it feels more real to me anyway. So perhaps part one is just a script. Allison really made the movie in part two with her husband Gabe and she was inspired by that to re-envision those events as the screenplay of part one. This is compelling to me because part one could be read as like a revenge fantasy for Allison. It feels like in the logic of this movie, Gabe just doesn't love whoever he's with. It's almost preferable to be the person he cheats with instead of the person he cheats on. In part one, Blair asks Allison a bunch of questions like, what are you working on now? Are you going to act in it? Are you going to film it here? And this feels like an opportunity to clarify what's going on, but you'll notice that Allison doesn't actually answer any of those questions. You know, there's something I've been really wanting to ask you. Do you find it weird acting in your own films? Or do you like, I don't know, get off watching yourself or something? Oh, no. Um, no, I actually find it kind of humiliating. I'm really interested in that line where Allison says that acting in her own movies is humiliating because in part two, obviously she's humiliated over and over. So I do see that as possibly evidence that this is a script based on those experiences. One thing that makes this theory less appealing to me though is that, you know, these movies are too similar. So if you imagine that part two is a movie that she just wrapped and then she writes part one. I mean, what is she going to release a movie that's almost identical to the one she just released or has too many similarities? I don't really see that. So like I said, I don't actually subscribe to any of these theories. I just thought I would explain them, but I see this as just two separate stories meant to be contemplated together. And I think it's worth mentioning that if the director wanted this movie to make sense, it would have been so easy. You know, he could have just put a bathing suit writing framing scene around one part and clearly indicated that that was either a screenplay or an actual movie that was made, but he didn't. So it seems like that's really not the point. And there's a lot more that we can talk about about Black Bear beyond what literally happened. So let's talk about themes. First theme I wanted to talk about is identity. There seems to be a strong disconnect in this movie between how people see themselves and how other people see them. So especially Gabe and Blair at the beginning, Gabe describes himself as a professional musician. He's annoyed that his wife didn't call him that. And then Blair describes herself as very independent and Gabe kind of scoffs. And then Blair also says that Gabe likes traditional gender roles and he feels like she's misconstruing what he said. Allison, in contrast, almost seems to enjoy being misunderstood or seems completely uninvested in the truth of how she's seen by these people. She seems like she's more interested in just playing around and saying whatever she needs to say to toy with these people. But overall, I feel like this theme of a disconnect between how people see you and how you see yourself makes a lot of sense in a movie about movies and actors because people have lots of ideas about what actors are really like that are false and really not based on anything real. So theme number two, suffering for your art or making other people suffer for your art. So the director, Lawrence Michael Levine, said in an interview that he doesn't do anything close to what Gabe does in the movie, thank God. Uh, he doesn't manipulate actors and torture them emotionally, but he said that he does sometimes cause suffering to himself with his filmmaking and his writing because of the difficulty of making films. And it was pretty hard to watch, but I felt like this was a really interesting and important thing to explore in a movie, Gabe's manipulation of Allison and his abuse of Allison, because stuff like this does happen in real life. There's lots of examples, but the one that comes to mind for me is Last Tango in Paris. Trigger warning for rape, sexual assault. I'm about to start talking about that now. So there is a rape scene in that movie and the director decided that it would be more powerful or more realistic if he didn't tell the actress 
that that was a scene in the movie didn't give her the script until or that part of the script until right before they started filming and he is quoted as saying that he wanted her to feel instead of act so I would call that an assault I would call that a real assault because he said he wanted her to feel he wanted her to feel like she was being assaulted and she did so that's terrible <laughs> That's terrible. And this is way less important, but it's also an insult to the woman's ability to act. It does pose an interesting question, which is, is a scene better? Is a movie better if some aspect of the acting is real? If it's if the person isn't acting? I guess so. But I don't know. Acting can be so seamless that it feels totally real. And sometimes in real life, people are melodramatic and it wouldn't actually seem real if you filmed it. And if realism is the thing you care about most, then you could just point a camera at whatever and it would be real it would also be very boring and more importantly i mean we can ask lots of interesting philosophical questions that we shouldn't answer because to answer them would be to do harm right like you could ask what would happen to a baby if they were kept alive but not given any kind of stimulation that's an interesting question what would happen we shouldn't ex run an experiment where we do that because that's that's abusive and that's torture and it's terrible. In any case though I think this is a really interesting question that this movie explores and a really interesting theme of suffering for your art, causing other people to suffer for their art, does it make it better, etc. And this movie did a great job of showing how even in a movie you know the actors emotions can be very real and the emotions might not go away when the scene is done. Now let's talk about dialogue style. So Lawrence Michael Levine might be my favorite dialogue writer at the moment. It's back to realism, so realistic. I mean, Allison is a weird character, so she does and says stuff that is hard to imagine a person doing, um, but it's interesting and it's consistent. And on a sentence level, I can really see people saying the things that these characters say. I think it's the perfect balance of achieving that while also cutting out, you know, ums and and pauses and stuff that wouldn't be interesting. It's about as realistic as you can make dialogue while still maintaining the sort of artistic facade. Lawrence Michael Levine also wrote and directed the Netflix show Easy that I really like that has some of the most interesting and realistic dialogue I've ever seen in a television show. I especially love the part in part one where Gabe is drunk and he and Blair are fighting but it's like they're having two separate arguments like he's having a ideological discussion with himself and Blair is clearly talking about their relationship. I'm going to show you this clip because I just love it so much. That's why all these things that you don't like, uh, nationalism, fundamentalism, white supremacy is on the rise, right? Globalism, feminism, those things are... What's your point, Gabe? Um, yeah, what is your point, Gabe? Okay, let's talk about some of the background stuff of this movie. Apparently they only had 20 days to film it and you'll notice if you've seen the movie that a lot of it takes place at night so they had to film overnight and sleep during the day and they really were in the remote wilderness so they lost power a lot and like the time crunch of part two when they're filming and they're they're you know losing time was reflected in the actual experience of making the movie which is just really kind of like mind-blowing and Aubrey Plaza talked about like feeling like she was going a little crazy while filming this. She, there were moments where she would forget the woman playing her makeup artist in the second half of the movie wasn't her actual makeup artist. So obviously this movie is interested in blurring the lines between art and reality, but interestingly enough, the experience of filming it also did that. So anyways, I titled this Black Bear Explained and decided to be very confident in my ability to explain this movie to you. But I don't think anyone should explain this movie to you. I think you should just watch it and figure out what you think. I think that's what the director intended. There is no right answer. He basically said as much. And please let me know if you enjoyed this video because I've never made a film analysis video before and I had a lot of fun with it. But I'm worried that no one's gonna watch it because it doesn't seem like anyone's watching this movie. <laughs> so I would really appreciate if you like, share, subscribe, comment, etc. and let me know if you'd like me to make more video analysis videos because I will. That's all for now, okay? Bye!